Here we are. It's very nice. Very, very nice. All right. Hold on to your britches, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> My dog just ate, and now she's got snot, apparently, just piling out of her nose. Uh, let's see. What are they going to do? Ah, yes. <laughs> I remember now. Bots in the house. <laughs> What's up, ladies and gentlemen? <clears throat> oh, cool. I get to do that. Yeah, we'll like that. Yeah, there we go. We. Wee! All right, let's start this thing. Push the buttons. I wonder. I wonder. Let's push some buttons. Where are my buttons? I am professional. There we go. Hey, giddy up! All right, hello, hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the live stream tonight. We are. This is a wonderful live stream brought to you by my time, I suppose. Stuff. But anyway, we're answering questions. That's what we're doing. We're just gonna hang out and you guys drop your questions in the chat and we'll answer them. Um, if you have any questions about our Kickstarter, Layers and Legends, you're welcome to ask them as well. Uh, or you can just ask Game Mastering questions. I'm happy to answer any questions. I don't care what we talk about. You could talk about business crap and finances and investment and dollar cost averaging. I don't care. We can talk about whatever you want. Um, I should probably have my live stream or my, my Kickstarter pulled up because we should have, I should have that on my screen. So that's sitting right there for me. All right. Just in case you want to take a look at that. All right. Yes. Get your bacon, beans, and rice. Absolutely. Agent Black. Thank you. Thank you. Agent says lovely content. Thank you, dude. I appreciate that. Uh, Mark Foyt, hello. What's up, dude? What's the weather like up here? It's 72 degrees. It's sunny and warm because 72 degrees is warm. I think that's about all I can say. There's nothing else to say. It's it's pretty nice. Aloha. Wow. Uh, okay, we'll get. That's a great question, Jim. Keep your questions coming, folks. We're gonna dive into the questions in a, in a moment here, I got to do like the, the, you know, the live stream kickoff stuff. So anyway, uh, today's Monday. We usually don't stream on Mondays, but you have special live streams brought to you by the Kickstarter that we're currently running. Yay. This is our Kickstarter layers and legends too. So if you are not aware, you may not, we have a Kickstarter going right now. We're going to give you two big fat, huge books stuffed full of fifth edition content that you can use in your games. The one book layers and legends, let me, so this is the Kickstarter page. You can go there. There should be a link in the chat down in the description and stuff where you can go uh, check out more about this. But let me pull up the, uh, where's my where's my clicky thingy, Bobber? <laughs> okay, so these are the two books. These are the alt covers right here. And Layers and Legends, the book on the right, that is going to have 30 adventures in it, probably more than 30 adventures. Actually, it's by default more than 30. And if we hit certain stretch goals, it'll be way more than 30 or more, more than more than 30. Anyway, Layers of Legends is gonna have 30 adventures in it or more. Loot and Lore is gonna have bunches of monsters, over hundred monsters in it, traps, puzzles, encounters, lots of other cool stuff, new rule sets. The whole idea of these two books 
is that you can you have your so you have your ongoing campaign right you have your campaign setting that your world your game takes place in and you got players and your players always want more content that's your job as a game master in part to give them more content more cool stuff to do in your game world these two books give you that cool stuff that you can put in your game world whether it's an adventure whether you just need a puzzle because like you don't you aren't good at puzzles or you want a trap or something these two books each of them is over 300 pages one of the layers of legends one is probably going to be pushing 400 pages there's tons of content in here that you can use in your games drag and drop use them as you need to in your games because players appetites for content never seems to end and rightly so because the game is tons of fun i just had a pathfinder 2 game last night um oh my gosh it was so much fun it was exactly what i needed after a stressful week at work so anyway that's what the kickstarter is Two big fat books full of cool stuff for you to use in your fifth edition games. So there's a link down in the chat in the description if you want to go check get more information. Look at some cool artwork. We have so much cool artwork going into these books. I'm artists are sending me stuff every day. Hey Luke, take a look at this draft. How's this looking stuff? And it's all looks really amazing. We have like we have a crazy awesome crew of artists working on these this Kickstarter. It's uh it's really cool to see. Every time they send me something, it's really cool. So that's our Kickstarter. Go check that stuff out. It's cool. All right. Um, so Kickstarter. Um, yeah, I think we'll just uh, we'll go. We'll. Uh, oh yeah, that's right. Patron shout outs. Yee. All right. All these wonderful people you see on screen are our wonderful patrons. They help bring this live stream to you. They also help us create a lot of the stuff that we create for folks over on the dmlayer.com we have free resources anybody can just go over there and get free stuff to use in your games just grab it and use it in your games it's 100 free our patrons help support that our patrons also get a monthly issue of layer magazine which is our premium content that we put out specifically for patrons and you can get back issues of layer magazine on the dmlayer store as well but the patrons help with the bill for creating all of the crazy amounts of 5th edition and Pathfinder 2 content that my team and I create. We put out over 60 pages of 5th edition and Pathfinder 2 content, like each, every single month. Uh, it's a lot of stuff, and our patrons get to use all that in their games. And uh, probably probably why they're patrons, because they get cool stuff. Now these folks right here, they support us at a higher level, and they literally pay me to read their names out loud so i should probably do that very appreciative of these awesome folks you see on screen right here and here we go aaron h agile m alex s alexander o alithana ellen d alathena amanda w's ambridge angelique k anton k art soccer ashley alucas beavis con bees in space ben d Black Wolf, Bradley H, Brandon P, Brian D, Brian O, Brian the Lion, Brian J, Carl C, Chaotic Wolf, Christine A, Christine B, Christopher G, K W, Colette H, Colin W, Connor D, Contrary Gravy, Corey A, Courtney H, Quan B, Dara T, Dazwood Up, David S, DeWolf85, Dylan W, Dean B, Derek E, Dice Goblin Wannabe, Don D, Draxus, James Gone. Who is in the chat, I believe, if not mistaken. Dungeon of Terra, Ed R, Edward B, Edward L, and Frabo and Durin72, Eric B, Philip H. Gabriel T, Gene A, Gene W, George E, George R, Greg P, Guapo, Gubin, GBTM, Heart U, HLD, Important, Iron Cascade, Jackie Pizza, Jacob H, Jacob K, James L, Jeff S, Jeremy W, Jerick, Jim P, Joanne P, Joel J, John, John A, John B, John D, John the Wicked, John Picanos, Jonathan F, Jonathan H, Jonathan S, Jonathan V, Jordan, Jordan A, Jose B, Joseph H, Joseph W, Josh M, Josh S, Juan, Justin, Justin J, Kevin W, Killsaver K, Kirby, Laura L, Laser of Scion, Letter Mage, Lena Hart, Linda, Loki, Lord H, Lieberclaw, Matlock, Ma Macy S, Mama D, Marcel V, Marcus, Martin E, Master New, Mike, Matthew C, Meepy, Michael S, Michelangelo, Mika J, Mirostal, Mitchell Mo 20s, Mordakin, Morganath, Morve, Nicholas S, Nick H, Nereth, Nostramo, Old Mad Mage, Oleg, Patrick D, Paul C, Paul C, Paul S, Paul Pevnik, Pivot, Porkchop, Bacon, Puppet Master, Randall C, Randy B, Rebar, Runner C, Richard M, Richard, Robert C, Robin B, Roll for Combat, Roll L, Ross A, Ryan, Saul R, Sakura, Samantha J, Sarah J, Sarah P, Scott C, Scott R, Sergio M, Shadow, Shane L, Sean the Ice, Simfan, 
Soul Naya, Steven, G, Steven, T, Steve, S, Sturm, T, Warner, Tabletop, Nerd, Tyla, Therese, T, Terry V, The O, The Diabolic Museum, The Jackal, The Dice Grob, The Dice Dragon, The Fuzzle, The New Bed, Ombre, Thomas F, Tor, J, TK, Tom B, Tom C, Travels T, Trinity S, Tyler D, Tyler R, Valagor, Victoria Q, Vladimir S, Wolof, Valas, Wesley K, William, William C, XX Retro, and Zombie Trami. Look at that. I feel like I read that very well today. I may have mispronounced a few, but I went pretty quickly. I think I just killed that reading of names. Uh, I'm pretty good at reading names. I, I wonder if there's like a job for me out there where I just read names or something. I could be like a TV person where I just read crap. I don't know. All right, let's, let's do the question stuff. Um, did I get to see the eclipse? I saw a little bit of it. I was picking up some medicine for one of my cats at the animal hospital place today. And I was leaving and there were a couple people that work there that are outside and they're like, hey, you wanna take a look at it while we're out here? And I'm like, take a look at what? And they're like, the eclipse. I'm like, oh, oh okay, sure. So they gave me the glasses and I looked at it and there was like a crescent eclipse or something. So it was, it was cool. I would have, no, I think, I think my wife did mention to me that there was an eclipse the other day but if she hadn't have said anything and, the, and the, the vet people hadn't have said anything, I wouldn't have even known there was an eclipse. So, yeah, I did get to see it. Kathy Evans, hello. How you doing? Kickstarter is doing pretty well. We are So the Kickstarter is at nearly 200,000. So we're just, we got about 3,000 to go and then we're going to cross the 200K thresh mark. So we're getting very, very close. Our next stretch goal is at 225,000 which unlocks, what does that unlock? More puzzles. So 225K is our next stretch goal and we're gonna unlock more puzzles to put in these big, fat, beautiful books for people. So uh, yeah, not too much farther to go and then we're gonna throw more puzzles. The puzzles will go in Loot and Lore 2, this book right here. Uh, there's, you can see here, there's the list of everything that goes in these books. There's a ton of stuff. Do you have any thoughts on Drag Daggerheart? Um, I have never, I don't, I haven't read the instructions, rules on it at all. I don't watch videos about it really. Um, the only thing, the only thing that I have seen, and this was a couple months ago at least, Bob World Builder did a video on Dra Daggerheart and I watched a decent portion of it. And then Bob was talking, we, Bob, um, Dungeon Coach and I have like a three-way chat thingy where we talk to each other and Bob was telling us He was telling us he was talking a little bit about Dag Daggerheart, I think Or we had a conversation a while ago, but I don't remember a whole lot of details about it uh, I, I, don't, I don't know anything about it um, So anyway, I e e <laughs> Even if I had thoughts about it, I probably e e That's one of those things where it's like do you dare say anything negative about that because people want to come kill you so, <laughs> but fortunately I don't have any thoughts because I don't know a whole lot about it. So I can't get myself in trouble, which assuming I would get in trouble because I might like it. Who knows? I just don't, all I know is you roll like D12s or something. That's the, the that's really all I know about it. So that's, those are my thoughts. I, I have no thoughts. <clears throat> Russ, hello. How you doing, buddy? Hope that you're doing good. I am doing well right now, kind of. I am exhausted, I am destroyed, I need a vacation. Uh, but other than that, it's, it's great. Have you seen the remastered version of Pathfinder 2? Any thoughts? Yes, I have, I have. So I have two of them, let me get them for you. They're right over here. So the people at Paizo are amazing. I love them. Uh, they sent me, free of charge, these review copies of the remastered books. And I have, we, I don't use the remastered rules in my games. Um, we, all, my, all my players, we just started playing Pathfinder 2 like about a year ago. And my players all bought the normal books. And after all of us buying all of the normal books, a year ago, like nobody is interested in buying another set of books and using the remastered rules. So we're still using the core, you know, Pathfinder 2 books, but I have the remastered rules. I have flipped through them a little bit. Um, I haven't really deep dived at all to be able to talk intelligently about them. The only thing I can say about the remastered books is that 
The organization seems to be way better than the core book. The core book I always have sitting right here on my desk. So this book is a pain to find stuff like, and the table of contents is just not, it doesn't do it for me. Like, <laughs> it doesn't tell you where to find anything. However, the remastered books, the table of contents is way better, much more usable. Uh, so, but like I said, that's, that's about all I know about it because I haven't really um, had time to do anything else besides that. And I, frankly, I may never because I have too much work to do. Uh, I get, I get like three times a day, maybe two to three times a day where I get leisure reading. Uh, one of those times a day is right before I go to bed. I always read a book, usually a fantasy novel. Right now I'm working through Brandon Sanderson's Mistborn series. I just finished the first book and I'm starting on the second book right now. So that's my one time of leisure reading. And then I have one other time of leisure reading that usually happens sometime in the morning where I get to read some books as well. Um, we will not discuss anything else about that period of time besides that I get to read books during it. All right, so there's my thoughts on that. I'm DMing a campaign in a desert with an economy that is crashing. Gold is abundant, but completely unnecessary because everyone would rather trade for food and water. Looking for tips. Uh, that is so general. What do you want? Tell me what your problem is. <laughs> Gotta be more specific. It's so, it's so general. I don't know. I don't know where to begin or what, what, what is the, what is an issue you have? What is, give me a specific question and then I can probably help you. I want to make my next boss battle, Orcus Demon Prince of Undeath, to be a huge special boss battle. Do you have any tips outside of using minions and seat stage hazards? My players are level 20. Oh, good gravy. So one thing that you have to do, and this is this is true, this is true for DD 5th edition at higher levels. Regardless, at higher levels, this is true. You have to consider what your players' characters are capable of, and you have to design the adventure, and in this case, a boss battle, around their capabilities. If you don't, and you need to tweak monsters and stuff around what they're capable of, because if you don't take, this is just the nature of 5th edition at higher levels, uh, if you don't take into consideration their abilities and what they're capable of, what spells they have access to and stuff like that, the boss battle might be over in two seconds. It could be a stomp fest because they have this one thing that does this, that like, you know, because Orcus was designed, what, three or four years ago or something, the stat block, and there have been splat books coming out that make more and more powerful characters and stuff, and they have access to all these different things and stuff. So you have to, you have to, it's, this, is, this is super true at the high levels. You have to design adventures and encounters and fights around what your players are capable of or failing that you need to have a really good crew of players who don't do sleazy bullcrap that ruins the game um like for instance i'm running a level are we level 20 i think my my, my ancient dragon game is level 20 right now i think we're all level 20. so we're running <laughs> yes we're level 20. i have to think about it uh these guys are all awesome. They don't do they don't do all the horse crap that you well they well okay so like they there there was a period of time a couple months or so where they they had a bunch of wishes at their disposal. I think they had a luck blade and then they had a ring of wishes. At any rate, I gave them and it's my fault, I admit. I gave them some items that gave them access to wishes, the wish spell and they started using wish spells. And as of course is not only your prerogative, but perhaps I would argue your your duty and necessity as a game master is that when they start wishing for crazy, crazy stuff, you gotta twist it, you know, to add a little bit of balance and stuff to it. And so things started to get twisted. The wording started to get twisted, like literal interpretation and certain things happen as a result of using the wish and there were, you know, consequences in the game world. And they found out that, hey, maybe maybe we should not use Wish to do crazy, crazy stuff. You know, if we just use Wish to replicate an eighth level spell or lower, then we're in the safe zone. Otherwise, bad stuff could happen. So there was a period of time that they were kind of doing some stuff. And then they were like, this, this isn't working too well. And then, and now they're back to just kind of, you know, you know, not doing 
the kind of crazy stuff you could potentially do at higher levels. So anyway, that group of players is awesome. And they, they make they make running a high level D&D 5th edition game not too bad at all. Uh, whereas otherwise it could be a real pain. Uh, if you had some people that just love to like take advantage of all the little loopholes and different things and do crazy combinations, running ga running fifth edition games at high levels could be a nightmare, depending upon your group and what they try to to get away with, so to speak. But my guys are awesome. T Bird says, "Luke, I haven't been able to make it to a live stream in a long time. Really happy to finally make it. I am just finished my group two year campaign and we're starting Pathfinder Second Edition." RECs for 5e -E Conver. Okay, I think, I think that means recommendations for 5th edition conversions. Oh my gosh. What? Whoa, 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 whoa. What do you... I don't understand what you're asking. No, I don't, I don't, I don't understand. Yeah, I don't understand. You're going to have to type that, that out in <laughs> a little bit more clearly for me. Sorry. <sighs> no, Puppet Master, I frequently skip numbers because... It's a, it's a mouthful, so. Uh, Door Dib says, I stopped running 5th edition about a year ago and I have been testing different systems, thinking about Pathfinder 2nd edition, but my concern is that it's too complicated and has too many rules, thoughts. Well, it depends on what you like, you know? Um, I am okay with a certain added complexity to it because Here's the thing, Pathfinder 2nd Edition in some ways adds complexity to what I do as a Game Master, but in other ways it makes what I do as a Game Master a lot easier. Because the game is really well balanced, I don't have to worry quite as much about throwing an encounter at my the players that is too hard because the math works pretty well and I can pretty much figure out and, and have a good handle of things. So, there are some ways it's a little bit more complex, but there are other ways that it's a lot less complex and it makes my job easier. So I think we have like, I've, in my opinion, it's like a happy little medium balance, you know, like there are things in fifth edition that are simple and nice. And then there are other things that make my job as a game master harder, you know, and, and Pathfinder 2, I think is the same way. There are things that are more complex than there are things that make my job easier. So, um, if you're, if you're coming from it, I don't know if you're going to like Pathfinder 2 or not. You know, I know I love it. I'm having tons of fun doing it. Uh, it just depends on what your, your tastes are, you know, um, because there are lots of other systems out there. Like I'm reading Shadow Dark right now and I like it a lot. And more than likely, at some point, I'm going to want to run, a, I'm going to want to run a Shadow Dark campaign because it sounds pretty cool. My wife is using the blender right now. I bet you guys can hear the blender going off because it's really loud. Can you hear that? Yeah, it's hitting the negative 25 decibels, so you have to be able to hear the blender. <laughs> but the, the upside is she's probably making something really good that I'm going to be able to eat tomorrow. So... <laughs> this is the price you pay. Um, Wall of Force and Sickening Radiance. Let's go home, boys. Oh, is that one of those OP combinations you can do? Yeah. <clears throat> uh. <laughs> oh, really? Oh, wait, what was this? What was this? Oh, okay, okay, I, I get you now. So you you gave me a post and you thought that it had enough information in it for me to give an answer. And I asked and I asked for a more more specific question. And because because I didn't give you an answer, now you're unsubbing because I wasn't master dungeon master enough for you. <laughs> okay, dude. You got me, man. You really got me. What do you want over here? Huh? <sighs> You post some super generic information, dude, and I asked for a clarifying question, and you're gonna freak out and unsub because I asked for a clarifying question and I wasn't master dungeon master enough for you? Whatever, dude. Whatever, dude. 
Go go to Reddit. I'm sure there's some wonderful people over there that'll help you or some other forum, dude. It's all good, man. All right, let's see. Let's find some other ones. Little guys down there making noise too. My party is a bit of dive into the fire without looking type. Ooh, yeah. They killed a single orc on sentry duty without checking the rest of the encampment. How hard should I go on them? Party of six, level four. I mean, it just, I don't know. Like, it, that's your call, man. Like, I wouldn't, look, you don't want to punish them necessarily, right? This isn't about punishing them and making them feel it and making them be like, oh no, we didn't, we we just dove in head first and now like the whole orc encampment is piling down on us and beating the crap out of us and we're all gonna die. Like, that's, like the point of the game is to have fun. So that's not probably gonna be fun. Now, I would probably, I would probably give them something challenging because they were a little bit, they lacked caution. So, you know, I'd throw some stuff at them to make them think twice about next time. Oh, maybe next time we should, you know, be a little more cautious. But, and and, 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 and part of what you want to do too is role play the orc encampment. So they rushed in head first, but did they kill the orc sentry before he could sound the alarm? If so, then maybe there are no consequences, you know? So part of it is role playing that scenario out as well, because if they kill them quickly and didn't make a lot of noise, maybe there are, nothing happens, you know? But at the end of the day, I would use your gut. Just remember that it's about having fun. You know, you want to have fun. You want your players to have fun. That's the real purpose why you're at the game table. So look, players do silly stuff at times. They do foolish things. It doesn't mean that every time they do something foolish that, you know, the hammer should come down on their head because then people don't have fun. And why are you, why are you there if you're not having fun? Okay, a fool's guide. I see your question. You're not gonna like my answer. So the question is, I have been having issues getting my players interested in my campaign. They always seem to be doing something else and aren't interested in what I'm doing. What can I do to change that? So, it's, so if I understand this correctly, um, your campaign is about X but your players aren't interested in that. They're interested in doing something else. So, and I'm assuming what you're not talking about is players on their phones or something where they're not paying attention and they're off doing something else. So, cause that's a different, that's a different issue, right? But if your campaign is about something and your players always want to go off and do other things, then I think it all, there's, there's a few different answers probably for you. The first thing is that you, you want to make sure that your campaign is about something your players care about, which is why when I start up a campaign, I will send a pitch to my players. I will tell them, hey, this is the campaign that I want to run. And I'll give them some high level bullet points about what the campaign is going to be about. Usually some good concrete details, you know, that gives them a good idea. And then I will see if they want to run that game or not. You know, so I pitch them something I'm interested in to see if they're interested. If they're like, yes, that sounds great, let's do that, then you're good. You now have buy-in from them. So it's always a good idea to try to get buy-in from your players when you're beginning to run your campaign because if, they're, if they all agree that, yes, we want to run that too, then you have a pretty good shot of them being interested in your campaign and doing the stuff that you create, you know? So that's the first thing. So you wanna make sure you have that. Now, you're already head into it. You're already in the in the midst of it. So you, that's a foregone. You, it's, it's too late for that, right? So now what you do is you just, you ask them. You simply ask them, hey guys, I've noticed that the campaign is about this. There are adventures about this. There are plot hooks to go do these things. You guys never seem to be interested in those things. And you always go off and do something else. What gives? Like is there what's what's the reason for that uh and you want to try to put it gently and nicely you know you don't want to be too like mean about it obviously but you want what you want to do is you want to find out why they're doing that they might simply tell you that that campaign is not interesting we don't care about that stuff we just don't care like our, 
Our characters aren't motivated. As a player, I'm not motivated. I just don't care about that. Uh, but these are the things we care about. And so maybe at that point, I mean, you have a couple options, right? Like you could change the direction of your campaign to focus more on the things that they clearly care about and make sure that you are shifting it in a way that is something that you're interested in and something that you care about. Because if you don't care about running that thing, then it's probably not gonna be fun for you and then your heart's not in it and that game, that campaign's gonna crash and burn. So if you can, find out what they care about and have a conversation with them, I'll, I'll, I'll obviously. And then if it turns out that they don't care about what you wanna do and they wanna go do this other thing and it, you are okay, you're okay with switching over to do a campaign more aligned with their interests, then just say, hey, okay, this is what I'm gonna do then. I'm gonna I'm gonna shift my campaign so that we are doing something more along the lines of what you guys are saying you're interested in. Cool. How's that sound? Yeah, yeah, let's do that. All right, sweet. So as long as you're you're happy running that campaign, then everybody wins, right? You just shift your campaign to align with their desires. As long as it aligns with your desires too, or you can make it do it in such a way that it's interesting and fun for you. Okay, that's that's that. So so after you have that conversation though, and let's let's now let's assume that you shift the campaign's direction and they're doing the thing and everybody's happy, then great, you're done. If you shift the campaign's direction and you find that the players are all of a sudden, so you change the campaign to be about the thing that they told you that they wanted it to be about, but then uh, you all of a sudden find they're going off and doing completely different things again. What's going on here? Then you might have, what you might have at that point on your hands is a group of players that just, they're, I don't know how to describe, I, I don't know the adjectives used to describe them, except to say that there are players that no matter what plot hook the Game Master puts in front of them, they will ignore it on purpose and do something else. They will always ignore it and do something else. My friend John had players like this once and he was telling me about them. He's like, Luke, it doesn't matter what, I, what plot hook I give them, they will always ignore it and do something else, always. And it was probably because the, for whatever reason, there are players like this, they, they just, they don't want to do anything that the game master suggests and they always want to go off and do something else. So if you get players like that, well, then you, I mean, you, you can just put up with it, I suppose, or you can get new players. Uh, probably more fun to get players who want to run the game that you're interested in running. And especially if you have players that intentionally will run away from anything that you prepared and put time into, like that's not fun. You know, if they're, if they're intent, if they're intentionally ignoring you, you know, just to screw you over. That's, that comes from a place, in my opinion, that comes from a place of malice. You know, like we know the game master spent time preparing this. <laughs> We're not going to do that thing. We're going to go do something else. Just, just so he wasted his time. And now he's got to just improvise. We're just going to watch him squirm. <laughs> like, come on, man, running a game is hard. And if you have players that intentionally treat a game master that way, I would say screw them, move on, find different players. They don't deserve to have a game, you know, if they're going to treat the game master that way, if they're intentionally doing that, you know, because that's just horse crap. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't put up with that. But you got a few different things you could do, you know. Um, and, and, and if it turns out that the campaign that you're really, really, really interested in running is one that your players don't want to have any part with, then, I mean, you, if you're, if you're hell bent on like, getting that campaign and running that campaign, then um, I suppose you could always just get different players that want to play that campaign. Um, but, you know, you got to make sure there are players that want to play it because if they don't want to play it, then you're in the same position you started with. Do you ever adjust your monsters to include some things like a feat or a different spell or ability? Yes. Um, I'll do simple things like pole arms. If, I, if there's a monster that has a pole arm, a lot of times I'll just give him the sentinel feet and the pole arm mastery feet. Just give him the feats. There you go. Boom. Then the players are like, hey, I'm going to move up and attack him. No, you don't. Reaction, attack, and then you can't move at all. Oh, crap. And then you introduce a phalanx of those guys. Like there's five of them in a line and they have pole arm mastery and the sentinel. Oh, baby. You, the players are good. Their minds are blown. Like for, you know, for like 15 levels, their paladin was doing that and it was fine. But the enemies turn around and start doing it. They're like, oh my gosh, what are we going to do? It was, it was cool. So yes, I absolutely do that stuff. It's really cool. 
Um, and I learned from my players too. Like most of the cool sleazy stuff <laughs> that I do sometimes, I learn from my players first, which is probably like karma if you believe in that, which I don't. Uh, but it's like, you know, whatever. <laughs> You've been reading The Black Company before bed? I don't think I've heard of that before. <clears throat> Copperlord says, I've been told that anything that is 5e compatible will work in Tom's Tales of the Valiant just fine. That's my understanding. That is absolutely my understanding. Um, my team and I like skimmed through one of the early betas of Tales of the Valiant and my the way that I summarized this best was if you hadn't have told me that this was a different game system I would have thought that I was reading fifth edition you know and so my gut impulse is to say that anything compatible with fifth edition is going to work with Tales of the Valiant that's just my gut impulse uh you're probably I have another guy who's like who was it he's a he's one of our moderators he's uh he might even be here I don't know maybe not no he's probably in bed he was like he was like, it's 5th edition, but with terminology changed, basically. So that's how, kind of how he described it. So you should be good to go, yeah. All those sticky notes make you feel good about yourself, sticky notes. Oh, dude, I have so many sticky notes in my Pathfinder 2 book. Like, I have a piece of paper stuffed in there right now. But yeah, it's just full of sticky notes. Labeled sticky notes so that I can find stuff, you know? And it's the same in my, like, Dungeon Master Guide for 5th edition. It's the same in my player's handbook for 5th edition, but yeah, just tons of sticky notes so I can actually find things somewhat quickly. Of course, Pathfinder 2 has Archives of Nethys, which is an online thing, which has pretty good short search, so you can find stuff pretty quickly there too, but I don't know, there's some things I just want to read in a physical book. I like having physical books. My friend is the opposite. He apparently wants to be railroaded. Well, there, I mean, there's comfort. I mean, there's comfort in railroading, you know? Like, I once had, I was, runs, I was once running Princes of the Apocalypse for a group. And the way Princes of the Apocalypse is designed, this is for fifth edition. I, I don't know what they were thinking. The, the, they're like, this is a sandbox. No, it's not. Anytime that you have adventures that are designed for certain level characters, it's not a sandbox. All right, it's designed for that level of character. And if you deviate from the level order, things are gonna be way too hard for you, potentially, maybe kill you, or they're gonna be way too easy for you. So you can't say that when you have adventures that are designed to be ran in a certain order, that it's a sandbox, it's not. Like, so that module is touted as a sandbox, and it's not, because it has levels associated with the adventures, and it's, it doesn't work that way. And the proof in the pudding was that when my players, I was running this for my players, and I was trying to run it in such a way that they kind of could do what they wanted and go to the different areas that they wanted. Because the way that Prince of the Apocalypse was designed is that there are, there are basically four different dungeons. There are four different dungeons and each of those four dungeons has three levels, all right? So in dungeon one, there are three levels to it, right? The first level is designed for a level three group. But if you go down to the next level, it's designed for a level seven group. And if you go down to the next level, it's designed for a level 11 group. And the next dungeon is the same. The first level is designed for level four. Next level is designed for level uh, eight. And the next level is designed for level 12. You know, so if you just keep going down, like you're skipping four levels at a time. It gets kind of crazy. And so these four dungeons, the way they were designed to be ran is that you would do one level of this dungeon and then you'd go to the other dungeon, which is like a day travel or something. You do one level of that dungeon and you would leave. Go to that dungeon, do one level, leave. Go to the next dungeon, do one level, leave. And go back to the first dungeon and do the second level, second level, second level, second level. Boop, 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 boop. Do the third level, third level, third. That's how it was designed. And so my players, it, like at one point, I mean, we never finished the module, but at one point my players were like, they were getting frustrated with how it was designed. And one of them just said, Luke, Luke, just tell us what order to run them in. Tell us where we should go, okay? We're tired of this, like getting in over our heads or something. Just tell us where to go next. We need to know where to go next. And so then I was like, all right, okay. then that's, I was like, all right, well, it's designed to go here. And I don't know, maybe it's possible that I wasn't implementing it well or something. I don't know. 
Uh, I just know that my players were frustrated and there was comfort in just knowing where you're supposed to go. So yeah, I can totally, I, I get that. Yeah, Khan, Khan Le Deluge, it, it's totally against intuition because you would think if you're at a dungeon and there are three levels, you should just complete all three levels, but it doesn't work that way. You gotta like, jump around, you gotta dungeon hop, boop, 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 in this big circle. It's just like, why would, you know, and and there's nothing, there, in, in the book itself, there's nothing that prevents you from just going down all three levels, right? You could technically do it if you wanted to, right? And so like, people will, will be like, well, you need to make, you need to put like, you know, locks on the dungeon levels, things that prevent the characters from going deeper, you know? Which makes sense, it's not written in a book, but even if, even if it had things that prevented you from going down a level, it still begs the question, like, <laughs> why was it designed this way? I don't, it doesn't go, I don't, I don't know. It, I just know it was frustrating for, for my players. Panzer says, what self-respecting player sees the dungeon has a lower level and then leaves to go to a different dungeon? Exactly. It's counterintuitive, which is why my players one day were just like, Luke, just tell us where to go. We're tired of this bull crap. Just tell us where to go. <laughs> Wookie Pirate, what's up, dude? Says, I just opened my secret art of game mastery book. Excellent stuff. Thank you to you and your team. You are very welcome. I'm glad you like it, dude. <clears throat> some Fred says some writer thought he was cute somebody thought he was cute and then it, it went through the entire design team and they were all like okay let's do it I don't I don't know because modules like that like if you open up the front of one of these you know official modules like there's a whole list of people that work on this thing and there's a design team with like I don't know 10 plus names on it and it's like somebody reviewed this and approved it and was and lots of people reviewed this and approved it and were like good to go, you know? And if there was playtesting of it, presumably, you know, playtesters were like, sounds good, let's go, or something. I don't know. Somehow, somehow it made it, I mean, it's, a, it's an official module by like the biggest company in like the RPG, tabletop RPG sphere, right? Like, so you... I don't know. It's just really weird. It's weird. If they put locks on the doors and keys that were located in different dungeons, I guess it could work. Feels like it would get old after three or four doors, though. Yeah, it, at some point it feels contrived, right? Where you're just like... Yeah. <laughs> my, my players have brought up... A, uh, an objection to puzzles before, you know, like some players like puzzles in their dungeons, right? They, they want to solve a good puzzle, right? And that's fair. A lot of people like that. That's cool. That's why we publish puzzles in our, in our, in our things that we publish. We put puzzles in there because people like them. But one time my players were like, they were literally like, Luke, like, you know, the puzzles are fun, but they're not logical. Like, why would anybody put a puzzle in the dungeon? You know, it doesn't, like it's illogical to have this puzzle that does this thing or that thing, you know? And, and you know, in all fairness, it's probably because, I mean, I probably could have implemented them in a better way that made more sense from a logical standpoint, you know? But I don't know. Sometimes you just, players want puzzles and you're like, all right, take a puzzle, you know? <laughs> I don't know. <clears throat> Well, I also, Amber says that playtesting likely consisted of only running the first floor of the first dungeon. Yeah, I don't know. But I think too that the publication schedule that companies sometimes set doesn't allow for incorporating feedback from playtesting either. Like I publish books, I have an idea of how long that process takes and everything that goes into it. And the larger the company you are, the more complicated usually those those processes are. So I see a lot of these like, you know, playtest documents going out and they're soliciting feedback and stuff. And I'm like, but the books, the books get published this soon. How do they possibly have time to like 
incorporate playtest feedback, make updates and and get it into the copy and I, how, how, how? So I'm, maybe they're just a lot better than I give them credit for, but it seems like sometimes they don't have enough time in the timeline to incorporate feedback from update or feedback from playtesting, you know? So sometimes it's like, do they just run playtesting just to have the appearance of doing it, but don't actually intend to do anything with it? Sometimes you wonder, you know, because you see these timelines and you're just like, how does this line up? Does this actually work or not? Matthew Chamberlain, hello, how you doing, buddy? All right, ladies and gentlemen, we are here today live streaming in part because we have a Kickstarter going on right now, Layers and Legends 2. You can go over, there's a link down the chat, link in the description. Uh, basically, back this project and you're gonna get two big, fat, beefy books full of fifth edition content. Um, let me let me go show you the last Layers and Legends. All right, so ah, ah, these things are so heavy. Holy crap. All right, so check this out. This, this is not, so our Kickstarter right now is Layers and Legends 2. This was our first Kickstarter, Layers and Legends, okay? So these books have already been fulfilled. Backers have these and all this kind of stuff. So, but these are like the first edition of it, right? Just to show you that like we actually make big beefy books. This is a reality. So in Layers of Legends 2, you're going to get, you know, the second volume of adventures and other things you can drag and drop into your games. Now, um, these right here were the alt covers for Layers and Legends 1. And we currently have the alt covers for Layers and Legends 2. Let's go over there. So these right here are the alt covers for Layers and Legends 2, right? These look amazing. I can't wait to get my hands on these alt covers. And then the alt cover, the normal covers for Layers and Legends 2 are these covers right there. And so, but what I want to show you is that these, so when we print books, when we print books, we use the super thick covers. Our covers are very thick. The pages are 128 GSM, which is thick. I don't know what the poundage is on that because the company we work with doesn't use paperweight in pounds. They use GSM as their weight measurement. So I don't know. It's thick though. It's very thick. And then we have thread bound binding and the focus on my camera is not going to do it very well, but it's thread bound binding. It's not the cheap glue crap binding the, the, where they, that the, the, some major tabletop publishing companies use when they shouldn't. It's thread bound binding. So it's super high quality binding, super thick covers, super thick pa paper and stuff. So this is, these are examples of books that we've done before, right? And our Kickstarter right now is for Layers and Legends 2, which will give you more books like this filled with adventures and stuff. So these are so heavy. I'm gonna put these over here. There we go. So if you want to get some big fat heavy books <laughs> that you can like probably beat someone to death with, not that I'm recommending that, but I'm just as a way of sharing how big these books are and how much content is in them purely as a probably inappropriate analogy. But you get my point. Uh, there's a link down in the chat where you can go back the project and get some really cool stuff um, or just report me to YouTube for like, you know, talking about beating somebody with a book, which I never endorse or recommend, unless they're really mean to you. Like if they're a bully and they're doing bad stuff to you, no, no, don't do that. Just go go talk to your teachers and parents because I'm sure they're gonna solve it, you know? What, you're starting to bite me? He's like, Luke, you gotta stop talking about that stuff. You're gonna get in trouble. Okay, all right, I'm gonna stop talking about that. All right. Um, no, I didn't have time to set the giveaway up today. I think I think we're probably gonna do, we'll do the giveaways on Thursdays, I think. Because usually before the Kickstarter, I would stream on Thursdays and now we're doing three days a week. So I think what we'll do is Thursdays, we'll run a giveaway and then the other two days, we'll just hang out and have fun, so. 
All right, let's see if I got some more questions in here. Matthew says, yeah, for the extra $10, I got the alt covers. Yeah, you're, you're so the alt covers, the alt covers that we're doing, um, will you stop biting me? You can't just bite me all stream. These alt covers, we're gonna have one print run. The print run for this Kickstarter, that's the only print run we will ever have of these alt covers. Uh, so yeah, if you want them, then you probably should get them during the Kickstarter because there's no guarantee that we're ever, I mean, no, I can guarantee you that we will never do another print run. We're doing one print run, and when they're gone, they're gone. Nihilus, hello, how you doing? Yes, so Copper Lord, the alt covers for Layers and Legends 2 were done by Brendan Lancaster. He is he is an artist. Let me, okay, so let me show you some of the artwork, guys. You probably want to see some of the artwork. I want to show you some artwork because... It is amazing. I'm gonna go and pull up some folders here that have some of the artwork in them for Layers and Legends 2. And we're gonna take a look at the artwork because we have artists working on it now, pulling an artwork. And by the way, no AI art. We do not publish stuff with AI art. So this is all real human, human artists. You could track them down, you know, not that I recommend doing that because that's like stalking and bad stuff. So don't do that, but you could track them down and have them draw cool stuff for you because they're awesome. Don't, don't do that because that's not, that's really creepy. Don't be creepy. And let's go to the artwork. Uh, interior artwork. All right, let's look at Brendan Lancaster first because he uh, is doing a lot of cool stuff for us. The problem is, is that sometimes they only send me Photoshop files and I need stuff that I can actually show. So let's take a look at this. This is a bust that he did for us. So that's super cool. And I'm gonna just, I'm just gonna bring up a whole bunch of different stuff to show you guys. Uh, oh gosh, let's go through the creatures. Let's go through the creatures. Let's close that down and make this bigger. This is one of the Aboliths. So we have several Abolith variants in Layers and Legends 2, and this is one of them right here. Will you stop biting me? I swear, I'm gonna bite you back. Who wants to see that? Who wants to see me bite Squeaky? Um, here's another Aboliths variant. This is all this is all from Brendan Lancaster. Everything I'm showing you right now is Brendan Lancaster. Um, here's another cool thing. Here's a nice little Dracomira, I think. Dracomira. It's like a cross between a dragon and a chimera, is what that is. This is some ah, oh, this is a bone fairy. This is called a bone fairy. This is a draw a doppled drake. And what happened? Oh, there we go. This is a Dracolist, a green Dracolist. This cat keeps biting me. This is an Infernal Legionnaire, a Infernal Poison Cultist, Infernal Poison Knight, and then we're back to that right there. Oh, a uh, red Drac, red Dracorilla, uh, the the Tooth Fairy, <laughs> Tooth Fairy. This is a wine spirit. And I have more too. We have we have a lot. We're 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 busy getting art commissioned. Uh here is a if it'll open. You what you wanna open for me? Oh my gosh. It won't open. Oh yeah, it is. It's opening, it's just doing it on the wrong. It's doing it where you can't see it. Are you kidding me? Come on, baby, you can do this. Okay, this is a full page piece of art. So we have lots of full pages in the books. Uh, each chapter will have a full page at the very beginning of it. So this one is for an adventure called It Came From Below. <laughs> Stinking sweet. I square squeaky, I'm gonna bite you back. I will bite you back. And this is from an adventure called The Hobgoblin's Wife. And I have so much of this stuff. This one right here is from Trapped in the Tower. And I don't know why they don't go on top. This one is from an adventure called, well, the adventure is not called Chaos Battle. So I don't remember exactly what the adventure is called. Uh, Wrath of Colivar is the name of the adventure arc, I believe. Maybe that's the adventure too. I think that's the adventure. 
So there's some artwork. That was all from Brendan Lancaster. And let's go over to Al Ferdowsi. So, oh, Al just turned in some stuff the other day. This is super cool. A failed Grecti, super cool. Speckled Grecti, very nice. The pale Grecti, these things are like, they, they, they inject parasites into people and it turns them into these monsters. It's cool. And then we have an elemental emissary, a noble genie, a jollity type of genie, I think. It looks like an ice genie or something. Uh, a doom priest. This looks cool. And then this is the doom room. That's like a half page for one of our adventures. And then the Alhari, another advent, uh, another monster. All right. So those were all from L for Dowsy. Let's go over to Isaiah Bradley. Let's see what Isaiah has given us. All right. So this one is a half page for it came from below. And then we have a half page from the Hobgoblin's Wife. I love the rain effect. Oh my, look at the rain effect on this. Oh, it's so cool. I like this one. And to save a silver dragon and the snow effect. Look at the snow effect on this. Oh, it's so cool. It's a half page for one of our, the adventure called to save a silver dragon. And then we have trapped in the tallest tower. That's the half page that goes along with it. That's really sweet. And those, okay, so those are all from Isaiah Bradley. And then let's take a look at Math, Mathis Kelza. We have a few busts from him. Uh, this is uh, Aspa from Hobgoblin's Wife. That's super cool. This is Old Sander from It Came From Below. Very nice. Look at the detail on that. That is crazy. Look at the look at the gray and the highlighting in the hair. Super sweet. And this right here is uh, Agnathus from To Save a Silver Dragon. The <laughs> stinking tariff. It's stinking sweet, man. I like that a lot. That's really cool. And those were all from Mathis. And then I think the other one we have stuff turned in from is Mitch Mueller. Let's take a look at some of theirs. So this right here is the Arboreal Titan, a big tree titan type, type thing. Uh, the Arcane Watchdog. The Blood Coral. Mirin Mar, I think that's a, a specific villain, a unique character that we have in the book. And then the Clockwork. Uh, I think that's not the full name of the monster, but it's a clockwork that has a couple shields because we can all look at the picture and agree that it has a couple of shields. And so yeah, those are all super cool. And we have more artwork being created by the day because we have several artists working on this stuff. So there we go. So there is your sneak peek of our artwork and stuff for Layers and Legends too. <laughs> Double shields, yes. Oh, you're a sucker for tree or forest guardians? Sweet. Well, we got at least one of them in the book for you. Lord Wise Wolf says, next year my players are in for some huge surprises. Oh yeah, dude. Yeah. We got so many monsters and we're gonna have all, not every monster has artwork, but like 95% of them have their own artwork. Like we're getting tons of artwork done for these books, monsters especially, because people want to see what the monster looks like, right? So yes, we're gonna have tons of beautiful artwork and I just showed you off a whole bunch of it. It's high quality crap. Like we don't, it's not like, cartoon drawings and stuff. We have like really good, awesome artists doing crazy good art for us. So I'm gonna do a cat strike and give some treats to my kitties cause they're freaking out on me. All right, so this is the cat strike. Let's see how many customers we can get. Let's go to our cat cam. Going to the cat cam now. woke up the dog is looking around that's dangerous the 
little monster woke up. Why don't you go down and get some snacks? Huh? Go get some snacks. <laughs> the little girl doesn't want to go up there. Look at her. Oh, here comes the doggy. The doggy's, the doggy's up and wandering. I should give the dog something. I should give the dog something. All right, excuse me, excuse me, excuse me, excuse me. They want catnip. They want catnip. All right, come here. Come here, doggy. Come here, doggy. You know, they don't they don't want their snack. They want they want catnip. Jeez, they're like they're like on strike. Even little guy, look at little guy. He's skinny and he's not eating it. What a little turd. Look at him walk away. Disdainfully walk away from the cat treat I just gave them. Oh, that's messed up. Well, the dog will eat it. The dog will eat all of that. That's all I got to say. Whew. That's a lot of treats. Yeah, I'd probably overkill since they're all walking away from it. Except for Squeaky. He's a balon de playa. He's got a big, huge, massive gut. He's going to eat it all. My decaf coffee fill up. Dungeon of Terra, you were backer number 10? That's super cool. This is what happens. My dog eats too fast. Did you just throw up on my floor? You little maniac. Don't throw up on the floor. Agent Black says, what are your thoughts on silly characters that stand out for a goofy concept than the rest of the party? I have one in my game and kind of conflicted about what I should do. It doesn't bother me. It, it, do, it doesn't, it, so, as long as the silly goofy character is not detracting from gameplay, it doesn't bother me. Like, as long as, as long as the game is still flowing and the other players are enjoying themselves and they're doing the adventure, they're doing the missions, they're going on quests and they're doing all these things and it doesn't like bring gameplay down, then it doesn't bother me at all. Like clearly the, the player who has the goofy character has a lot of fun with the goofy character and they're, they, they that's fun to them, you know? And so if they can coexist and play their goofy character and everybody else can still have fun playing their characters in the rest of the game, there's no problem. There's not a problem at all. The, oh, here we go. The dog found it. I found the snacks. I'm going to eat them now. And Squeaky's like, oh, I lost my snacks. The little monster found them. The little monster. <laughs> Diaper doggy. <laughs> uh, she literally took a crap on one of our live streams. So now she wears a diaper. She actually wears a diaper all the time because she just can't control herself. She's a chihuahua and they are known to be hard to potty train. Um, and she's blind too. So she just problem see if she, if all she did was like occasionally have an accident that's one thing but she has an accident and then because she's blind she walks in it and tracks it around so that's a problem <laughs> okay uh what were we talking about oh the silly character concepts yeah as long as it's not a problem and it's not causing a problem then it's not a problem i think that's, just, that's the way it is i like playing silly characters um, I, I have to be careful that I don't, I don't cross the line, though, because sometimes the silly characters can get the whole party in trouble because the silly character might be doing stupid stuff in, with an NPC that then gets angry and then there are bad things happen. So there are, yes, silly characters can cross a line that causes bad things to happen in the game for everybody else. And that's where you got to be careful, you know, and I'm sure I cross that line from time to time. And I have to, I do my best to hold myself back and not be too, too bad. <laughs> so. 
I don't know who the banana guy is. I don't, I've never played Fortnite. I don't know. What, I mean, I, I know what it is, but I've never played that. Now she's like walking around trying to find snacks. <laughs> sniffing, sniffing. Oh, you like my rogue voice? Cool. Yeah, I think all we need to do is <laughs> stab him. Just give him a little stabby stabby and then everything will be just fine. It's a great day to be a cat. Yeah, except for that none of them ate them. I'm new to DMing about 10 sessions in and next session I'm running a one shot for a group because one of the guys has to miss due to a new baby. I'm running a heist mission, any tips? Yeah, so I have an entire video about running heists. Um, you can go check that out for like the in-depth analysis on lots of stuff to do with heists. So there's a, one of the things to remember about a heist is that a big part of a heist is the planning phase. So you design the thing, right? The, the location where the heist is gonna take place. And you have, to you have to decide what the goal is. What is the main concept that's behind the heist? What is their objective? So you need to decide what the objective is. For instance, let's make this a very simple example. Let's pretend it's a bank vault. Very simple example, there's a bank vault. And the objective of the heist is inside this bank vault, there is a, let's say that they're going after an orb of annihilation. There is an orb of, no, I think it's called a sphere of annihilation. There is a sphere of annihilation inside this bank vault. Their objective is to get that sphere. That's it. You don't have to fight, kill. You don't have to steal anything else. All you have to do is get in there, get the sphere of annihilation and get out. Now you might do some other stuff while you're in there, sure but your objective is that one specific thing and it's in a bank vault and there's a larger bank around it and there's security measures, there's traps, you know, there are guards and stuff. And so you decide what the objective is and you set up the scenario, right? You set up what the defenses are, the traps and all that kind of stuff. And you set that up. But here, now that's, that's pretty similar to a normal adventure, except that in a heist, their goal is very defined and very specific. And so once you get that set up, now the players in a heist, if we're talking specifically about a heist, they now, the first thing that they do, the first part of a heist from the player's standpoint is the information gathering phase. They need to find information about this bank, about the guard rotation, about who the guards are. They wanna find information about, are there any traps inside that we might have to overcome? Um, and then where is the vault located? And they want, you wanna have this, part of the game where they're trying to find this information out. Now, it might be because they try to like send a druid in as a spider and get some basic information. They might just like watch the bank from the block over on top of the rooftops to try to see what's going on. They might go to the 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 city planning office where like the architectural bl blueprints are. And like, of course, they're not gonna show you the blueprint of the bank vault. And so you might have to break in to the, the city planning office to get the, to steal the blueprints so that you then have the blueprints of the bank vault. But there's this entire information gathering phase that happens at the beginning of a heist. And so you want to give, that, that's a big part of running a heist adventure is allowing them to gather this information, right? And that's part of the adventure. And then you don't know how they're going to necessarily gather that information, right? You set up scenarios, your players decide what they're gonna do, and then you have to adjudicate and run the game, right? after they gather information, then what you do, then you run the planning phase. So now the players are like, okay, cool. We got a bunch of information. We know all this different stuff, but they probably don't know everything, right? But we know what we know. And now we got to decide what our plan is. And they're going to spend some time planning, right? Planning. This will probably take a while. It'll take longer than you're accustomed to probably in an adventure, because this is pretty important, planning out the heist. And then you move on to the execution phase. And this is where they're actually going to go do the thing. They're going to go into the bank and they're gonna to try to get into the vault. Now, they've done some information gathering, they have a plan, so they have a good idea of what they will encounter, but there's always gonna be some surprises in there. There's always gonna be some things you throw in there that they're gonna be like, oh, we didn't know about that. And then they have to figure out what they're gonna do in the moment. And that's important to have those because you want to have some mystery. You wanna have there to be unknowns and you wanna throw a wrench into things. You wanna throw that extra surprise in because that increases the tension of the moment, right? And so that's the general idea of running a heist. Those are different phases and kind of how it plays out. Um, 
And when you're, I think when you're actually running, so the, the, the temptation for you, the thing you have to be careful not to do, not to do, is you're literally going to be there in the room when your players are planning their heist. Be careful not to, in your mind, be thinking about all the different ways you're going to foil what they're planning on doing because that runs contrary to the purpose. You don't want to be thinking about how you're going to foil what they're trying to do. Instead, while they're planning, you as the game master want to be doing your own planning. And what you're going to be planning is, okay, if they do that, how would the, the scenario react? How would it react? So if they, if they try to go in through the roof, there's like a skylight in the roof. And they're gonna, their idea is to cut out a hole in the skylight and lower it down through a rope. Okay, well, if they do that, like given the scenario and all the different like, you know, security devices that are in place, what will, what might happen, right? If that, if they were to do that. And let's, let's just say it just so happens that that skylight happens to have a magical alarm spell on it. And it will trigger some mage off somewhere else who will then relay the fact that the skylight has been breached and that will send up the alarms. And so maybe you're, that's what, that's the thing. That's what's going to happen. And so if they go up to that skylight and they don't find the alarm spell and dispel it or disable it or bypass it somehow, well, then something could happen. The alarm could go off, right? So, but while they're planning, while they're doing their planning, you need to be doing your planning about how would the the scenario react or how would the guards react maybe nothing happens maybe maybe there is no protection on that skylight maybe it's an oversight right there's absolutely no protection on that skylight because whatever reason you know so i think but but that's part of what you do while you're running it and you want to make sure you plan out as thoroughly as possible what all the different security measures would be as well right think like if you're protecting a bank vault and you're protecting a bank you know what kind of security measures would you have in place you know so those are some basic ideas. Uh, again, I have an entire video on heist that you can go check out. They'll probably go into more detail. Um, I made the video somewhat recently, so I should know more about it, but I make a lot of videos and I don't have a good memory. So that, there you go, that's what you get. <laughs> Christine says, my husband will, will use stabby stabby. As we watch TV shows and movies anytime someone has a knife. Nice. <laughs> I've never used Blades in the Dark. Um, I've heard people talk about the flashback mechanics though. And I think the way the way they described them, I don't know if I'm a fan of that. Uh, if I and correct me if I'm wrong. But I believe that the flashback mechanic is such that when you're in the middle of like the heist or the adventure, if you come upon a problem in the moment, then you have a flashback to your planning phase and how you guys decided to overcome that, right? And then you're able to implement it in the moment, you know? And to me that, unless I'm misunderstanding that, to me that just, it feels unsatisfying because you didn't actually, when you were doing your information gathering, you didn't find that out. You didn't find it out at all. You, you literally missed it. And so it, it seems much more satisfying to have a surprise and be like, oh no, now, now we have to like figure out how to overcome this thing that we didn't anticipate. That seems, for me, my point of view, that seems more interesting to me than to be like, oh, oh, there's this, there's this security measure on the skylight. However, you guys found out about it, flashback, and you guys, decide, how did you guys decide to overcome this? <sighs> to me, that just seems like you're skipping, you're skipping the information gathering and planning phase, and you're just going right into the adventure, and then you're doing everything simultaneously through the through the mechanism of flash, flashback. So, I mean, I would actually have, I would have to like play it and see it in practice. Um, but that doesn't strike me personally as a, an interesting mechanic. It's unique, you know, it's different, but I don't, I don't know. 
Unless there's some sort of limit on the flashbacks and they, they only have so many that they can use or something, but I don't know. It's one of those things where like on paper, I'm very not convinced, but you never know until you actually do it. The GM can say, no, that couldn't have happened. Yeah, but you know, you know how that usually goes over. Like if there's a mechanic that allows you to have a flashback where you could have planned for something and the, and the GM says, no, you can't actually do it. Then it really feels like you're squashing, like you're nerfing the players and squashing something that they should be able to do. So I, I get that you can always say no, but oh, uh, that players usually don't like that. Like if the game says you should be able to do it and then the GM says you can't, that usually doesn't work very well at the game. You know, I don't I don't want to have to do that. I want I want the game mechanics, the rules of the game to provide the solution. I don't want to have to be the, the joy killer as the game master, you know. So Alex, Alex, you're very welcome. I'm happy to help. Um, I'm happy to hear that you, you're finding the content content helpful. Yes, very cool. Alex also says, I'm doing a full homebrew campaign as my first attempt because modules didn't sound interesting to me. I mean, that's fair. Most of the time, I don't want to run modules either. I like homebrewing. I'm a, I'm a homebrewer. As far as adventures go, adventures go. I don't do a lot of homebrewing of like classes or spells and stuff like that. I don't really care about that stuff. But as far as adventures go, I almost all my adventures I run, all of the adventures that I currently run for my games are homebrewed. So I love homebrewing adventures. It's just, it's part of the fun. For me, it's, it's part of the fun of being a game master is making my own adventures. I really, really enjoy that. But that's, that's me, right? I, I totally respect that not everybody has the same cup of tea. Lots of people love writing modules. So some people don't have time to design their own adventures. You know, some people just don't have the luxury of time and hours it takes to design their own adventures. And, you know, there's something to be said about professionally designed adventures should make it a little bit easier for you as the game master to run your games and give you that pre-prepared content, you know? So I, if you if you do homebrew or you don't, totally respect it. Everybody's prerogative, you know, and people that have different preferences and stuff. Am I still in the dungeon? I don't know. Were you in the dungeon? Did, what did you do to get in the dungeon? <laughs> By the way, uh, as a segue, I would be remiss if I didn't mention that we literally right now have a Kickstarter going on, Layers and Legends 2, where you can get two big, fat, huge, beefy books full of 5th edition content for your games. Adventures, one of these books, the Layers and Legends book there, is stuffed full of over 30 adventures. And the way we design our adventures is such that we, so some, some modules you read them and some adventures you read them and it's very clear that they were meant to be read, but they weren't necessarily meant to be ran at a game table. And they certainly weren't made to be referenced while you play. And the way that we do our formatting for our adventures makes it so that you can easily reference them while you play. They'll have read, read aloud text, obviously, but if there's a cabinet, it's very, very, very clear what the cabinet looks like, the formatting and stuff. And actually, let me see, let me see if I can, oh, you know what? Yeah, 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 we have a totally, I have an example for you. So if you go to our Layers and Legends page, you can totally, uh, we have a free sample that you can take a look at. I'm gonna see where it is, there it is. So we have a free sample that will show you the formatting that we use when we publish our adventures. And it's specifically designed to help you prepare for the adventure quickly and then reference it and use it at the game table when you're running the game. And this will just kind of show you the base, some of the basic formatting. So we use a lot of, so obviously there's read aloud text, but we use a lot of like paragraphs. Like this will tell you all about the creatures. And then the, here's a, about a clue. Um, this will tell you about the ashy prints. This will tell you about the doors. So our, we're very intentional with how we do our formatting so that you can quickly find what you're looking for. Um, in the adventure. That's about the catwalk. Here's about the catwalk doors, you know, the large barrels. Oh, you want to know about the large barrels? It's right there. It's easy to find. So we're very intentional about how we format and publish to, to make, our goal is to make it easier for game masters to prep their games and run their games. And so that's, that's what the kind of thing you're going to be getting with Layers and Legends too, uh, if you back this project. And those are the alt covers and these are the regular covers right there. So there you go. Thank you. 
Uh, so Nihilus says, how much of a difference is it to prep for a module or for a homebrew adventure? As in, which one would you say is harder? Gen I mean, it depends on the module. It depends on how easy... Some modules are harder to prep than others. Some modules you can prep very quickly. Some modules are going to take you a while to prep. And, and uh, we're, we're talking about pre-written adventures, pre-written modules. Some are easier than others, obviously. Um, and, and as far as prepping your own homebrew game, well, there's so there's two stages of prep. There's, there's essentially two stages of prep. Come on. Yeah, 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 yeah. The first stage of prep is when you're designing the adventure. Okay, usually that takes place before the day of the game session. The second stage of prep is when you're getting ready to run the adventure that you designed or that was already designed. And that stage of prep is prior to the game session. This is this is what I so so like my homebrew adventures, I will design them days, weeks, months in advance of the actual game. And then the day of the game, I'm reading through what I designed. I'm refreshing my memory. I'm looking up monster stat blocks. I'm looking up spells. I'm preparing myself to run that adventure because I don't want to look up. I don't want to be unfamiliar with monster stat blocks when I'm running the game. I don't want to have to look up spells and what they do. I want to have a good idea of what all that does in advance of my game session. So the day of the game session, I'm prepping to run the adventure that's already been designed whether I designed it or whether it's a pre-made adventure, all right? So here's the thing. If you are using an adventure, a pre-written adventure module, for instance, it could be Layers and Legends 2, it might be Layers and Legends 1, like it might be our original one that we did, Layers and Legends 1, or if you're running something else. Ideally, if it's pre-written, you shouldn't have to spend time creating the adventure, right? That Because that's already done, it's already done. All you should really need to have to do is prep the adventure prior to gameplay because it's already been created. Therefore, so theoretically, theoretically, if you're using pre-written material, it should save you that step. And then all you need to do is prep the adventure prior to the game session. Read the adventure, get familiar with it, and then look up monsters, look up stat blocks, look up spells and stuff so you can run it smoothly at the game table. There's a lot to be said about a smooth game where the game master is prepared, knows what they're doing, and is running the game smoothly without a lot of interruptions, without having to look crap up on the book, without a lot of like, what does this monster do? What does that spell do? And oh no, I, I don't know. Ooh, I gotta look this up. And, and they're they're thumbing through the module and stuff. There's a there's a lot to be said about being running a smooth game where you are prepared. And that is one of the primary reasons that I have two phases to my preparation. I create the adventure, and then I prepare to run the adventure. Those are two separate things. Two separate things. It's super, super important to running a good game. So, so what is harder? Theoretically, writing your doing a homebrew adventure and then also prepping it is going to take you longer than um, using something pre-written and then prepping it before a game session. Theoretically, but it depends on the pre-written adventures you get. Like if you get something from that we publish, I like to think that they're easier to prep and easier to run, so it should save you some time. But I've, I have modules on my, sh not these shelves because I'm trying to get, I'm getting, I'm currently getting new bookcases, so these are pretty empty. But I have books where the, they're pre-written modules and they're not easy to prep. Like they're, they're, you can tell that they're written to be read, not actually used at the game table. Um, which is probably fair because a lot of people don't use them. They just buy them and they sit them on their shelves, which is fair. I mean, I have a lot of books I don't use. I just sit on my shelves too. So who am I to talk? Um, but it's gonna, it's gonna vary, but theoretically, it should be easier to run something pre-written than to make your own, theoretically, theoretically. <clears throat> the best way to cre critique a DM as a player, vice versa. I'm always hoping for a sneaky tip. So, gosh, the problem, the problem with giving people feedback is that unsolicited feedback is almost always unwelcome feedback. I, if, 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 if there is, if, if I'm a player in a game or I'm the game master running a game and if what somebody is doing is not actually causing a problem, 
If it's not causing a problem, then I'm probably not going to talk to them. And there might be ways that they could improve as a game master or ways that they could improve as a player, but unsolicited feedback is usually unwelcome feedback. And so I'm usually not going to say anything unless they ask me. If somebody says, hey, Luke, you've been a player in my game for this long. Is there any feedback you can give me about how I'm running my game and ways that I could improve? If they ask for it, I'll tell them. But if they don't ask for it, I'm not going to tell them squat because they might get offended. They might take umbrage to it, right? However, if, if there is a problem, if the way that they're running their game is causing a problem for me or other players, or if I'm the game master and a player is doing something that's causing a problem, then I'm going to talk to them. And I'm going to talk to them because it's a problem. And that's a totally different situation than if there's just an opportunity for improvement, right? And so that is my general advice. But if, if you are going to talk to somebody, whether they ask for feedback or whether um, you're going to approach them, then I definitely, I, I would recommend that there's this idea of called constructive criticism. And I think the way that they usually phrase it is that you're supposed to not just say what the problem is, but give um, potential ways that they could improve or something, you know? And I think there's some truth to that. Like, you don't want to just say, this is a problem. You, you want to give a potential solution, you know, like, hey, you know, I noticed that you're on your phone a whole lot during the game and that you're laughing at the, the funny cat videos and stuff. Well, you know, that causes a, you want to, you want to, this is causing a big problem because that, da, 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 you know, and then I, you know, I'd like you to not cause a distraction for everybody at the game table, you know, so don't laugh out loud or something or, hey, better yet, don't watch cat videos at the game. And if the game's that boring, then, you know, maybe, maybe, maybe you don't like my game and I'm a bad game master and you should find another, another game or something. I don't know. But offer a solution besides just complaining about something, right? And if somebody's if somebody's approaching you for feedback, I would be very careful and very very um, uh, intentional about giving them positive things, things they are doing well, right? Things that they you want to you want to reinforce and say, hey, okay, you're asking for feedback, great. These things right here, you're doing super well. I love it. Keep it up. Good job. Keep going. And then you're gonna say, okay. Now, these are things that there's some room for improvement. This, this, and this. Don't go crazy on that list. Give them a couple things they can improve. And then give them potential ways that they might consider improving on those things, right? And then the third thing you want to give them as feedback is um, things that they aren't doing that they might consider doing that might improve the game. Like, hey, you know what? Um, you never run any downtime for us. And it might be something cool to consider doing because it would give us the opportunity to blah, 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 you know? And so it's, this is the, this is like a classic concept called, um, keep doing, stop doing, start doing right. Uh, and they probably, there's probably some fancy an acronym or something to help people remember that. But that, that's the basic idea. These are the things you should keep doing because they're, you're doing really well at them. These are the things you should stop doing or make better or correct. And then these are the things you should consider starting to do because they might be really cool and we might enjoy them. Right. So that's like the classical way to give feedback to somebody. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, I have to go. I literally have a meeting right now with Zach and he and I are gonna talk about our Kickstarter. So it's eight o'clock, I have to run. I will be back on Thursday, Thursday at 6 p.m. Eastern. I'll be right here. We'll be doing Q&A again. And I notice that a lot of people or throwing out questions, so I'm sorry I didn't get to them, but come back on Thursday and just throw your question in there again and I'll do my best to get to them. Um, but I have to run. I have a meeting right now with my dude, Zach. So I will see you all later. Have a wonderful evening. All right, I gotta go in the stream.